Hello, and welcome back to part two of the Molly Tibbetts case. If you haven't listened to part one, feel free to go back and listen to that first. It's a little on the longer side, but I lay out everything that happens before the trial. So this is going to be the trial and anything that happened after that or in the meantime. Because I try and do in chronological order the case, and then I, I'll go back and tell you what like Molly's family had been doing in the meantime. Because there was a four-year gap between when Molly's killer was caught and the trial because of normal stuff. And then COVID kicked in and everything got all fucked up. So a lot had been going on in the meantime that I'll get to after the trial. So I guess I can just get started. I did have, a, I mentioned it, I did have 11 minutes of banter on the last one. So this is, this part's definitely going to be shorter, but um, it just made sense to split it up like this. Like I said in the first one, there was, it was too clean of a break exactly where I needed there to be one. So thank you for coming back for part two. It's always so funny because I look at the stats and when I do two part cases, the stats for part one are so low until part two comes out and then they both shoot up. So I know some people will wait until both parts are out before they even listen to part one. But if you are a subscriber on the Patreon or on Apple podcast, you do get both parts right away. If you want to listen right away and then also don't want to wait and you can cancel at any time. At least on Patreon you can. I don't know how Apple Podcasts work. I'm sure you can. And I think I still have a free trial set up for Apple Podcasts. So, But you got you got to use that at the right time. It's only going to get you one <laughs> week's worth of bonus stuff. Don't forget to go to the website if you are interested in reading the transcript of the case. Not the case. Of the episode. Basically. I have typed out exactly... Well, not, I don't type it out. My editing software automatically turns this into a Word doc file that matches up pretty much exactly with what I am saying out loud. So you can follow along if you like to read and listen. The website also has a Spotify player at the top of every case post. So you can hit play and read along. And then inserted in the transcript are photos of what's going on at the time I'm talking about it. So if that's your thing, don't forget that exists, madisonshelby.com. Let's get started, because it's 10 a.m. on Sunday, and I want to retire and do nothing for the rest of the day. (laughs) And also my throat is starting to hurt from recording for so long today. So, picking back up at the trial. Remember, we left off with the trial kept getting pushed back and back, and they had done a very long, not very long, I guess, but they had focused a lot of time from like March to November of trying to get a lot of Revere's confession repressed because of the way that it was, I want to say extracted, but that just sounds way, way too serious. But the way that they had gotten it wasn't right because of they didn't read him his Miranda rights right, it was very late, he was falling asleep, things like that. A lot of time was spent on that, and then COVID kicked in and things got all messed up. So the trial was pushed back until May of 2021. Remember, Molly was murdered. Revere was caught 2018. So her family has been waiting a very, very long time for this. So before the trial started, Judge Yates ruled that there would be no media allowed in the courtroom because of COVID. But he acknowledged intense public interest in the case and said that news outlets can operate remote-controlled video cameras to broadcast the proceedings live on the internet or television. So he's like, I don't mind if you broadcast this case, but you can't physically be in here doing it however you want to work that out the jury was selected on may 18th that consisted of eight women and seven men there were 12 jurors and three alternates of the 15 12 were white and the remaining three were hispanic or latino on may 19th powershick county attorney bart claver delivered opening statements for the prosecution he basically laid out the timeline of what happened between revere and molly the day she went missing saying that Revere admitted to these things and basically said, like, there is no other conclusion to reach other than Revere did this. Like, you can't possibly come to a different one because it just doesn't make any sense. Nothing, well, I should say nothing else makes sense. What happened here makes perfect sense. It fits too good. There's no other conclusion. The defense opted to defer their opening statement until after the prosecution rested their case, and I'm not sure why. Doing that allows the prosecution to set the entire tone of the case and trial. Like, usually, they would both give an opening statement. So you could sort of see 
okay, this is what the prosecution says happened, and this is what the defense said happened. So the whole time you're sort of thinking of these conflicting things. With the defense deferring to the end, the prosecution is laying out, they're telling you this is what happened, and then they're proving it to you without you ever he- hearing what the defense is going to tell you what actually happened, if you know what I mean. That was very weird to me. I'm not sure why I even Googled, like, why would a defense defer opening statements and it doesn't seem like there really is a good idea or a good strategy behind it. If if you know why someone would do that, please tell me. I'm very interested, and then I can <laughs> tell everyone else. So the prosecution's first witness was Molly Tibbetts' boyfriend's brother. Oh, sorry. I just got a text for my, my therapy appointment reminder. <laughs> so the prosecution's first witness was Molly Tibbetts' boyfriend's brother, So Dalton's brother, Blake, apparently Molly was staying at his house when she went missing. But remember I said she was staying at her boyfriend's house. So I'm guessing him and his brother lived together. That's how I would take it. Just because they did, when they were going through the case of when Molly went missing, they did always say she was staying at her boyfriend's house. So I'm just assuming her boyfriend and his brother lived together. That's how I would take that. Blake testified that he received a call from his brother asking that he check on Molly because she never showed up for work. He's like, go home and see if she's okay. He testified that there was nothing unusual at the house and that Molly and Dalton were not having any issues to his knowledge. The defense specifically asked him about infidelity on Dalton's part, and he, his brother like very much denied that. He's like, Dalton was not unfaithful. He was not cheating on Molly. The defense tried to allude to Dalton having anger issues, but Blake was also not having any of that and denied it. He's like, they weren't having any relationship problems. He wasn't a cheater. He wasn't an angry person. Everything at home looked fine. I have no idea what happened. The next witness the prosecution called was Molly's boyfriend, Dalton. He testified that they had been together for three years. He said they weren't on and off. They never broke up. They were very much in love. He testified that he was out of town when Molly disappeared and he had not planned to come back that entire week. So when he received a frantic call from Molly's co-worker when Molly hadn't turned up for work, he called anyone he could think of to help and did testify that he opened a Snapchat for Molly at 10.30 p.m. on July 18th, the night she went missing. I'm not sure if they are actively making the distinction of that's when he opened and not when he received it because when all this happened, they made it seem as if Molly's Snapchat account sent him a Snapchat at 10 p.m., But now he's testifying in specific language that he opened a Snapchat at 10.30 p.m., not saying that's when the Snapchat was delivered, which honestly makes the most sense. The whole time I was researching this case, I kept waiting for an explanation as to why or how Molly sent him a Snapchat at 10.30 p.m. So I think this is them finally making the distinction of that. Maybe it wasn't sent then, but Dalton opened a Snapchat from her at 10.30 p.m. and she was at his house, but she could have sent that, whatever. However... When questioned by the defense, Dalton admitted to having an affair and withholding that information from the police because he didn't think it was necessary. And, I mean, luckily it wasn't. Like, it really didn't matter. But had they not found Rivera, this would seem extremely shady on his part. So, luckily it didn't matter. But had they not found Rivera and it came out that he had been cheating on Molly, this would not be a good look for him said that Molly was aware that he had cheated on her and she was upset by it. He also did admit that he had previous issues with anger and fighting. But, like, we know he didn't do it. So, like, this all seems ridiculous to even point out. But this this is what happened in the case. The defense also asked Dalton if he wanted to be there, like, be there as in be in court, fighting for justice for the love of his life. And he said no. And then clarified that he didn't want to be in the same room as Rivera because he believes he is guilty of murdering Molly. Power check deputy Matt Simpson took the stand as the responding officer to in the initial report of Molly being missing. He basically said nothing at the house seemed weird and everyone appeared to be acting how you would expect for them to be acting in that situation. It's so like nobody was acting weird or shady or not sad enough. He's like everyone was acting exactly how you would expect them to. The woman who was the last person to see Molly also testified. Her name was Christina Stewart. She was a hairdresser who knew Molly's family. She said she was driving to her parents' farm when she saw Molly running on the road. She was at her parents for 30 to 45 minutes and then left, and she didn't see Molly when she was driving home, nor did she see the black Chevy Malibu. The next day, on May 20th, Pamela Romero also testified. That was the officer that read him his Miranda rights and was sort of with him that whole day he confessed. 
She testified that they had a good conversation. He could understand and comprehend her because her first language was also Spanish. She's basically trying to say there was really no language barrier between them. She testified that she showed Rivera photos of his car from the security footage of him driving and Molly jogging. She said Rivera told her he remembered seeing the jogger three times. The first time the girl sort of waved at him. He acknowledged it was a girl and that she was attractive. Ramiro then basically went through the confession he told her and how he led them to Molly's body but couldn't give them any more details on what happened because he didn't remember. The defense again talked about how long he was questioned, how he had been awake for 24 hours and he was practically falling asleep when he was telling Romero all of that stuff. It was a very harsh S, which is one of my least favorite sounds on the planet, so I'm <laughs> very sorry. Powershot County Deputy Steve Kivy took the witness stand that day also. He testified as to like what was going on when they finally zeroed in on Rivera. He testified that the FBI was able to use Molly's cell phone to sort of figure out where she may have been. They were finally accessing like cell phone towers, things like that. He said there was some kind of what the FBI called an event during something like this at a certain point along 385th Avenue. He said all of a sudden Molly's phone is traveling at like 55 to 60 miles an hour down a gravel road and then it just shuts off. So they have her. They can see that she was like on foot running or walking or whatever, going very slow. And then they can sort of see her phone just take off at 60 miles an hour. So they know like she was in a car at some point. Friday, May 21st, Iowa State Crime Lab criminalist Tara Scott took the stand to testify about DNA in the case. She basically said that when they tested Molly's clothing, there was no semen and not enough blood to get any type of DNA profile from it, and that they did not get DNA samples from anyone from Dalton's home the day they searched it. So they basically are saying they never really looked into anyone else. They never really took any evidence from anyone else, and any amount of DNA on Molly's clothing was so minimal that it wasn't enough to even get a sample from. Amy Johnson with the Division of Criminal Investigation also testified in regards to the Chevy Malibu and that the blood in the trunk of the car did belong to Molly. They were able to get her DNA off of like a water bottle or something she had left at home. It did match Molly's DNA profile. She described Molly's body being found with her arms above her head, her legs slightly apart. She stated that Molly didn't have any underwear or shorts on at the time they found her. They were about, like, 20 feet away from her. She also searched Rivera's house, and they found no evidence that Molly was ever at his house or that he had ever had any of Molly's things at his house. They also, this day, continued the cross-examination of Romero because they didn't finish with her the day before. They showed her footage from the interrogation of Rivera falling asleep, to which Romero stated that she had never observed him falling asleep. However, in a transcript, Romero noted that when she returned with food for him that he was asleep, so she definitely knew he was sleeping at some point. A clip was shown of Rivera in the interrogation room eating the sandwich Romero gave him, and he was on his phone while he was doing this. He had his phone at this point still. The sandwich was the only thing he had to eat for the 11-hour interrogation. He was only allowed to go to the bathroom one time. So he had worked 12 hours. He had been up. For almost 24 hours, he had went to the bathroom and ate one time during um, the 11 hours. Also, this day, a student at the University of Iowa was in the courtroom and took some photos of the jury for the school newspaper, which you you cannot do. The judge confiscated their camera, deleted the pictures, and banned them from the courthouse. I'm assuming they were, like, on a recess or something because they had said media was banned from the actual courtroom. So I'm assuming they were just in the courthouse, and when the jury had, like walked out to go to a different room or eat lunch or something, they had, like, snapped a picture of the jury. Which, like, if I was on a jury for a case of this magnitude, I wouldn't want to be photographed and put in the paper just because, one, there's so much pressure to find this man guilty because this was such a high-profile case. Molly was so beloved. They want justice for Molly. I think the pressure of people knowing that you are deciding whether or not to put this man who absolutely did and who people do absolutely believe did it behind bars. I just thought that was an interesting part. It has nothing to do with anything, but don't do that. On Monday, May 24th, when they resumed um, the trial after the weekend, the prosecution rested their case. DCI Special Agent Trent Valletta started the day talking about how the FBI and DCI used Molly's FIPA data to try and establish the running route she took so that they could start trying to pull Surveillance footage from that route but that it was really Logan Collins who broke the case wide open when they submitted their home surveillance footage that showed Molly and the black Chevy Malibu. So maybe that's it. 
Remember when I was saying on the last episode, I'm not sure what took so long to get the footage of Molly and her murder on camera, but they must have released or approached people on the route. They now knew she was running and asked if they had any footage, and that's probably how that came up. The defense asked Valletta why no other people of interest were ever investigated the way Rivera was. Valletta was just basically like, well, there are no other suspects. Like, no other suspect had given investigators the location of Molly's body, admitted to encountering her that, encountering her that evening, or her blood in the trunk of their car. So that's why this is the only person looked into. The day ended with testimony on the autopsy results by Dennis Klein, the state medical examiner, and an Iowa forensic anthropologist. He concluded that Molly had been stabbed anywhere between 9 to 12 times and that by the time she was found, her body was in the advanced stages of decomposition because of things like the sun, the rain, bugs, insects, elements of that sort. Molly had damage to her upper spine and torso. They couldn't tell much else from the evidence they had. They couldn't tell which stab wound killed her. They couldn't even tell if the stab wounds came from the front or the back by this time. So they have like no really other evidence. They just know that. It's looking like she was, she died from a stab wound. Dr. Klein said more than one of the major arteries can be found in the part of the neck where Molly was injured and what was with what was likely a single-edged knife. A murder weapon has never been recovered by investigators, despite agents searching Revere's home and vehicles. The next day, on May 25th, after the prosecution rested their case, the defense gave their opening statements and started presenting their case. Revere's attorney said in the opening statement that everyone involved deserves justice and that your heart should break for Molly Tibbetts and you should want justice for her, but also that Revere deserves justice and that they don't think the prosecution has proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt. She also brought forward the idea that... Sorry, Harvey just jumped on my lap and my voice is giving out. (laughs) She also brought forward the idea that Revere, claiming he blacked out when he murdered Molly, and that's why he couldn't remember what happened, could have been planted in his head by the police. So they're saying when he said that he probably murdered Molly, he just couldn't remember, that idea was given to him. Revere's family took the stand to talk about what a good person he was and how he has never been violent and was always a positive influence and that they tried to see him when he was being questioned or arrested and they were denied access to him. The mother of Revere's children also took the stand and testified that she knew Dalton Jack from high school and that he was pretty racist and that Revere had no history of blacking out. Like She had never heard of him blacking out from anger before. And that she, I don't know if it's true that Dalton Jack was racist, but they're just trying to put the idea in the jury's head that it could have been someone else. So they're just saying whatever. The defense then had Molly's boyfriend Dalton take the stand again. They, again, are trying to make Dalton seem any level of shady so that there can even be even a sliver of doubt about Rivera. Because remember, as a juror, if you have even a shadow of a doubt about who did it, then it's not clear and convincing and you're not supposed to convict them, in theory. So the defense brought up texts from Dalton about his previous anger issues and infidelity. They also brought up that Dalton only called Molly one time when it was reported that she was missing. The defense asked if Dalton recalled telling Molly that he was madder than bleep for no reason. That was redacted because it was a cuss word. I'm not sure what cuss word. Days before her disappearance, he had told Molly that. Dalton said he could not recall. He also revealed he had planned on proposing to Molly on an upcoming vacation. The defense also presented the fact that there was other DNA in the trunk of the car, but the expert witness did say that the DNA sample was just too weak or too contaminated to even test to see who it belonged to if it wasn't Molly or Rivera. The defense continued their case the next day on May 26th. So May 26th, this is when Revere tells everyone two men forced him to be involved in Molly's murder. This is what he's now is saying what happened. He was planning on cleaning out his car for a date he had coming up. He went to his uncle's house to pick up a vacuum and returned home, but it was too hot to clean out the car. Also, his family had testified a few times throughout the case that Rivera did tell them he was supposed to go on a date. Anyway, it was too hot, so he went to take a shower, and when he came out, there were two armed men in his trailer. He described the the men as wearing long sleeves, long pants, and stocking caps. One was armed with a knife while the other was armed with a gun. He said that they told him I shouldn't do anything stupid and everything was going to be okay. They instructed him to get in his vehicle, the one with the knife sitting in the passenger seat and the one with the gun sitting in the back seat. Revere stood and pointed to the area where they spotted a woman jogging. 
Rivera stated that the man in the front seat had left for about 10 to 12 minutes. While he was gone, the man in the back seat began to whisper. He stated the man said, come on, Jack. When asked if he was trying to implicate Molly's boyfriend, because remember, his name is Dalton Jack, his last name is Jack. He said, no, that's just what he heard, and he has no idea who those people were. When the man returned, he told Rivera to continue driving for about 300 meters and was instructed to stop and give the men his keys. Rivera testified the two men got out and the trunk of the vehicle opened. He felt the vehicle move and the trunk shut before the men returned. He said they continued to drive until they got to a white house and the men told him to turn around. Shortly down the road, he was instructed to pull over to the side of the cornfield. The men instructed to give him his phone and keys. Before the men left, Revere claimed the men told him not to say anything about what had happened or they would, quote, take care of Iris Gamboa and his daughter. So that is his ex-girlfriend and the mother of his child and then his daughter. So he said they knew his ex-girlfriend by name, so that terrified him for the safety of not only her but his daughter because it sounded like they were pretty serious. When cross-examined, Revere said the men ran toward the road and he didn't see them again. Revere said he got out and inspected the trunk where he found Molly's body. He said there was a little movement but no real sign of life, so she could have still she could have not been quite dead yet at that time. He testified the body was fully clothed in sports clothing. He carried her into the cornfield and covered her body with corn stalks because he didn't want to expose her to the sun. When asked why he didn't call the police, Revere said he was scared and he knew it wouldn't look right. He said he found his phone, his keys, Molly's Fitbit, Molly's phone, Molly's headphones in his trunk, and he discarded Molly's belongings on the side of the road, which would make sense because I don't think they ever found them. Revere testified that he would have taken this incident to the grave because he was afraid for his family, for his daughter, his ex-girlfriend, and believed he would be at fault for the crime. When it was brought up that he, like, could have called the police and the police could have kept everyone safe, he said that he didn't know where his daughter was at the time and he generally avoided police because of his immigration status. When pressed about this insane story, he had no further details of why he was chosen, how they knew where he lived, how they got inside of his house, nothing. He had, like, nothing else to give about this. When the prosecution asked him about his 11-hour interview, he basically said that the police coerced him into confessing. He said they were accusing him of a lot of things. They kept using the phrase, help yourself, and told him that sometimes people do stuff and forget or black out, planting the idea that he could have blacked out or he could say that he blacked out to them. And that could explain why he had no details on how Molly was murdered. The defense then had Dalton's mistress on the stand. She testified that he had been in recent contact, and after they broke things off when he was with Molly, he tried to rekindle their relationship and told her that he would leave Molly for her. She told him no and then shared those messages with Molly and said Molly was still not unkind to her, even after she had basically told her that she was also seeing Molly's boyfriend. The defense also allowed a woman to take the stand who had called the tip line, accusing her father of murdering Molly. I'm sorry, but like this is the most I've talked since the surgery and my voice is starting to give out. I'm not like almost, almost done, but I don't have too much longer. So just bear with me. It might start sounding a little weird. So where was I? So the defense allowed this woman to take the stand who had called the tip line multiple times, accusing her father of murdering Molly. Jamie Slife testified that her father, Ron Pexa, was physically and sexually abusive to her, her siblings, and her mother. She said she submitted three tips to law enforcement about her father because he lived in the area of Powashek County that police were searching, where Molly went missing. The prosecution questioned the relevance of her testimony to the case. She stated that her father's abuse had escalated to death threats. She basically said, I'm here to state the facts. Based on the man I know him to be, I felt the right thing was to call the tip line. Like, he should definitely be looked into in the murder of Molly. May 27, 2021, both the prosecution and defense made their closing arguments. The prosecution again laid out the mountain of evidence against Rivera, his confession, the DNA evidence in his car, the fact that he was on camera following Molly, he knew where the body was, just all of that. And the fact that he had taken literally years to bring up these mystery masked men. Remember, this is going on for four years. At any point, he could have said, listen, I think I need to tell you something. He didn't do any of that, and he has, like, the most evidence you could possibly have <laughs> against a person. The defense opened by saying this woman was a sp spectacular young woman. She was destined to do great things. This young lady was on her way to being something special, no doubt about it. The loss of Molly Tibbetts was tragic, and the reason I mention that 
is because the loss of someone like that can evoke a lot of emotion, and it has evoked emotion. Freeze said emotions have no place in the deliberation room and that the jurors should not decide this case with emotion tugging at their heartstrings. And saying, like, you can imagine there was a huge amount of pressure to solve this case. So, like, basically alluding to they would do anything to get someone behind bars for this case as fast as possible because people are terrified and they're pissed about it. The defense focused on the fact that Rivera was scared for his daughter's life and that his confession was hardly an actual confession and the fact that no murder weapon was ever found. They also brought up the fact that there was other DNA and fingerprints in the trunk that they never bothered to investigate and the lack of investigation into Molly's boyfriend. They didn't check his phone records or anything like that. So they're like, if he was truly out of town, just pull the cell phone tower records and prove that he wasn't anywhere in the area. The state then called Dalton's boss, who testified that he logs their hours for them. Like, Dalton never logged his own hours. It's just not how the business worked. So he knew that Dalton worked until 7 p.m. the night Molly went missing and was at work at 5.30 a.m. the next morning. They also did not look into Ron Pexa at all, even though he lived in the area that Molly's body was found and was like a pretty credible tip that could have and should have been looked into. They brought up the lack of motive also. He's, they said this man is a 5'7", 125-pound illegal immigrant, is angry at Molly Tibbetts, who he had never met before, and resorts to killing her, stabbing her 9 to 12 times because he's angry. They said the evidence we do have about Christian Bahena Rivera is that he is not an angry man. He's not violent. He's hardworking. He came to this country for a reason. You can bet he wanted to stay in this country. Basically being like, why would he do this? The prosecution ended it with basically telling the jury to just follow the evidence. On their final rebuttal, they were like, yeah, you can listen to all that. That's fine. But he knew right where Molly's body was found and her blood was in his car. So why don't you just think about that? The jury deliberated that evening and into the next morning. On May 28, 2021, the jury returned a verdict of guilty of first-degree murder for Rivera. The sentencing date was scheduled for July 15th, but guilty of first-degree murder will get him life in prison, so it's not like they're trying to figure out what to do. He will just be formally sentenced to life in prison without parole on July 15th because Iowa didn't have the death penalty. So that was like the mandatory sentencing for first-degree murder. The prosecuting attorney, Scott Brown, said Molly's family are relieved. They're pleased with the verdict. The family of Molly Tibbetts is a great bunch. They've been awesome to work with, and the circumstances, of course, is always very tragic. They've been very supportive of everything we've done. We just wish them the best in moving forward. Revere's attorney said they plan to file an appeal and take other action in the coming weeks. Chad Freeze said there's a lot of people in this case whose stories didn't check out well enough for us, and that was a problem for us. Can we tell you who did this? No. We can tell you that getting to know Christian Bahena Rivera, we are very surprised that he would be the kind of person to commit a crime like this. He is nothing but a soft-spoken, respectful, kind person. Every person we have talked to in the last two and a half years who have any interaction with this man echoes that. He has been a delight to represent from a legal standpoint, from a lawyer standpoint. So his lawyers filed for a new trial before the sentencing hearing, claiming they had new evidence. And Judge Yates actually allowed the new evidence to be presented at the sentencing hearing on July 15th. The motion for a new trial stated that this evidence would certainly have made a difference in the verdict. The defendant chose to testify and spoke of two individuals who were involved in the abduction and killing of Molly Tibbetts. The DNA from the defendant's trunk identified other individuals who were contributors to the blood mixture. It also helps explain the relative scarcity of blood in the defendant's trunk. While perhaps not every bit of the account fits neatly into into the defendant's account of the events, enough of the facts fit to certainly question whether the state would have been able to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt had this information been known and presented to a jury. So, the new evidence they have is a man named Arnie Maki, who is a current inmate who claimed that after hearing Revere's testimony, came forward and testified that he was told a very similar story from a completely different inmate. Court records show that Maki claims the other incarcerated individual admitted to being a part of a duo that killed Molly under the orders of an unnamed 50-year-old male involved in the sex trafficking trade. He goes on to say that the plan included incriminating a Hispanic male for the murder of Molly. Another report they filed indicates another individual corroborated some of the inmates' claims. This third individual reached out to the Mahaska County Sheriff's Office just hours after the defense rested its case, completely unrelated to Maki. These are, like, not two people who are in co- in cahoots together they're um completely separate accounts so their account was eventually given to the powashek county sheriff's office later that same day police described this person as very emotional and likely intoxicated documents detail this person's statement that 
The supposed new culprit said that Mexicans shouldn't be in jail for killing Molly Tibbetts because I raped and killed her while holding the individual at gunpoint. So not all of this is a slam dunk, obviously, that emotional intoxicated person. That doesn't doesn't sound right at all. But the argument they're trying to make is if the jury had heard this, it should have been enough to make the prosecution's case not clear and convincing or prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So do they think this is true or that these other people actually did this? Maybe not. But it should have planted enough doubt in their minds to not be able to convict Rivera. So at the sentencing hearing, they focus on this new evidence. The prosecution testified that they had actually offered to stop the trial to allow this to be presented at the actual trial, and the defense said no. The prosecution claimed the defense said the new evidence did not align with their client's story. Mackey originally thought statements made by fellow inmate, now identified as Gavin Jones, were exaggerated. According to Mackey, Jones admitted to being part of a duo that killed Tibbetts after seeing her in a sex trafficking trap house run by a 50-year-old man, which honestly just sounds ridiculous. Rivera's attorneys focused on a man named James Lowe in the area who had briefly been investigated for sex trafficking. Lowe was connected to the disappearance of 11-year-old Xavier Harrelson, who went missing on May 27th. So, Rivera's lawyers are trying to prove that, like, something else is going on in this area. And if the jury knew that, this case outcome would have been completely different. The judge ruled that Rivera wouldn't be sentenced until he decided whether or not to grant the motion for a new trial. So, they pushed back the sentencing hearing. The two men named as a mystery duo came out the next day and obviously denied any involvement in Molly's case. They were like, okay, that wasn't us. They formally presented this motion for a new trial on July 27th. I don't want to go too far into that because it's just ridiculous in my opinion and it really doesn't matter. Maki says what he said before about being told by another inmate that they were part of this plot to murder Molly and frame someone else. And that Revere was set up by two men who were involved in a sex trafficking ring and that someone saw Molly at the trap house, allegedly, and that they heard from someone else that Xavier Harrelson's mom saw Molly at the trap house also. Which, why would she be at the trap house? I have no idea. The whole thing is just weird and seems very obviously untrue. On August 2nd, the judge denied the motion for a new trial. He's like, yeah, no, I've heard enough of that. On August 30th, 2021, Revere was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Molly Tibbetts' mother, Laura Calderwood, provided a victim impact statement that was read by a victim witness coordinator. I am going to read what she wrote in its entirety now. I mean, we've already gone this long. I might as well just read the entire thing. Mr. Rivera, I come here today not because I feel the need to address you. However, I come here to give a voice to our daughter, granddaughter, sister, girlfriend, niece, cousin, and friend, Molly Cecilia Tibbetts. Molly was a young woman who simply wanted to go for a quiet run on the evening of July 18th, and you chose to violently and sadistically end that life. I want to address the chain of events you set off on the morning of August 18th after you led authorities to Molly's remains in a cornfield. Do you know what it's like, Mr. Rivera, to be woken up by your youngest son, Scott, telling you the sheriff needs to talk to us? Scott and I stood in the entrance of our home where sheriffs Tom Kreigel and Matt Mashman stood with tears in their eyes. It took them a minute to find the words to say we hoped for a different result. However, we found Molly's remains today. I thanked them for their service and they left because there was still a lot of work to be done. I led Scott, whose eyes were burning with tears, to the living room and sat him down on the couch. Scott, I said, I'm so sorry. I'm going to call Aunt Billy over to the house to be with you because Mom has a lot of work to do. Next, I needed to tell my son Jake. Jake was in his apartment in Iowa City, and I did not want him to hear that his sister was not coming home on the news. Knowing my sister Kim was headed to Iowa City for work, I called her and I said, Kim, they found Molly's remains this morning, and I need you to pick Jake up and bring him home. It was a race against the clock to notify all the people who cared so deeply for Molly that she was not coming home. It was very important to notify the people who cared deeply about Molly so they did not hear this on the news. Imagine what it's like to call Molly's father, Rob, who resides in Fresno, California, and say, Rob, I'm so sorry. I have to tell you this, but they found Molly's remains this morning, and I need you to come back to Iowa. Can you imagine Mr. Revere as a father having Paulina's mother taken away from you and having to tell your daughter that she will never be coming home? Paulina's, um, Revere's daughter, by the way. However, the most difficult person to tell was Molly's grandmother and my mother, Judy Calderwood. Judy truly believed her granddaughter would be found alive. Because who could harm such a beautiful, vibrant young woman so full of life and promise? Who could harm Judy's precious granddaughter, let alone brutally murder her and dump her body in a cornfield? This was heartbreaking news that needed to be delivered in person. I entered my mother's home and she greeted me with a big smile and asked if I wanted a cup of coffee. There was certainly no easy way to tell her the news. However, it had to be done before her phone started ringing with loved ones sending their condolences. 
I very quietly and softly said, Mom, I have some bad news. They found Molly's body this morning. But we know where she is now. Judy Calderwood's unwavering faith had been brutally shattered by your senseless act of violence. Can you imagine Mr. Rivera sitting across the table from your madre and telling her Paulina is never coming home? I am aware that you know Ulysses Felix Zandoval and his family, Uli as I call him, was a classmate and a friend of my son Scott. Did you know Uli was at the press conference where authorities announced that you, Christian Bahena Rivera, had been charged with the murder of Molly Tibbetts? Uli immediately started crying but knew that he needed to call his madre before she heard it on the news. The Felix Zandoval family was devastated. How could this young man they fed and foster be responsible for such a heinous crime? Do you know, Mr. Rivera, that Uli's parents had to leave Brooklyn because they were receiving death threats? Do you know Uli lived in our home for the last year of high school so he could finish his senior year and play sports? However, Uli's parents did not get to experience his senior year with him because of your sense of act. Because of your act, you are then employer Craig Lang lost all of his employees because those workers were afraid of what would happen to them. Because of your act, Dalton Jack will never get to give Molly the engagement ring he had purchased for her. Because of your act, Molly's father, Rob, will never get to walk his only daughter down the aisle. Because of your act, Mr. Rivera, I'll never get to see my daughter become a mother. I do hope one day Paulina has an opportunity to become a mother, but how will she ever explain to her children who their grandfather is? This is the legacy you left behind for your only child, Mr. Rivera. I don't know whose situation is worse. That was kind of hard for me to read. That was one of the hardest impacts, um, victim impact statements I think I've ever read. Maybe because I'm so involved in this case, I've been researching it for so long. So after that, Rivera and his lawyers appealed his conviction sometime in 2023, maybe 2022 with how slow things work. I wasn't sure. I could, I could only find when it was decided. I couldn't find really when they had filed. They raised two issues. First, Rivera argues that the district court should have suppressed statements he made to law enforcement. And second, Rivera asserts the district court should have granted his motion for a new trial based on the newly discovered evidence and a Brady violation. A Brady disclosure is when prosecutors provide to the defense any evidence that is favorable to the defendant, so they have to present up any evidence that's favorable or could help the defendant. So a Brady violation is when they don't do that. So they're alleging they had evidence that could have helped Rivera and they didn't bring it forward. To make a long, unnecessary story short, the Iowa Court of Appeals denied his appeal in October of 2023, upholding his conviction and life in prison sentence. According to case law, this is what they decided. They said, We concluded that the court properly found statements Rivera made to law enforcement before the placement of an immigration detainer occurred when Rivera was not in custody and determined that Rivera voluntarily waived his Miranda rights to, so maybe the second Miranda rights, following the discovery of the victim's body. Finally, we conclude the court did not abuse its discre discretion when it denied Rivera's motion for new trial. Accordingly, we affirm his conviction for first-degree murder. So he is... Still in prison and hopefully will be forever for the murder of Molly. So now some updates. Like I said, I wanted to do the case in chronological order. I really didn't want to cut in and out of the trial and other things that had been going on in the community and Molly's memory at the same time. So I'm going to sort of go through what her family had been working on while all of this was going on. So shortly after Molly's body was found, the community sort of created this movement called Miles for Molly. I think it started as a hashtag like, if you're going for a run and you post on Instagram, hashtag miles for Molly, just, like, show support for Molly and run for Molly. And then it sort of turned into an actual organized run. The first one in their area had around 100 people show up. It's still going on. When I searched it, it just happened in July of 2023. So it's still a thing. Miles for Molly really struck a chord with other women runners because what happened to Molly is not that out of the ordinary. I mean, her being murdered, a little out of the ordinary, yes, but women are harassed while running all the time. 46-year-old Natasha in Georgia posted about Miles for Molly and how a few years ago a man had stalked her while she was doing her, like, routine outside run, like she would run outside all the time, and this man was stalking her. And it scared her so much she started running on a treadmill. Until one day she just couldn't do it anymore. She loved running outside. She said, why would I let this person ruin what I love so much, which is running? I got so angry. I'm not going to let my fear keep me from going outside. We are harassed because of what we have on. We're told we shouldn't do certain things. We should carry our keys in our hands. Why can't we run? Why can't we just go out and run? So she did the five-mile run for Molly. Carrie from North Carolina posted a similar sentiment after running five miles for Molly. She posted on Facebook. She went out for a run like she did most days. For Molly, running brought comfort, it brought peace and purpose, and for those five miles, the world made sense. 
Molly is hundreds of women I know, love, and respect. Molly is part of the running community, and though I never met her, she is all the women I pass on the streets and trails. She is like family, and someone took Molly from that community, from Brooklyn, Iowa, and from her family and friends, all because he couldn't respect her enough to handle rejection. Being a runner does not mean we deserve the honks, the catcalls, or the unnecessary comments that we get every single time we pound the pavement, but we get them and we continue on, terrified. Sometimes when I run, I think about how I would fight back if I had to, and I should be free to let my mind wander and enjoy the time I have out there. So next time you see a runner, please wave, don't honk. Please respect that she's pushing her body to better herself and her health and leave the comments to yourself. Parents, teach your boys to respect women and teach them how to handle rejection with some shred of dignity. I hope this is the last time we lose a runner to something like this. Today's run is for Molly. Hashtag miles for Molly. Later that same year, her family set up a memorial fund to go toward children and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital. Molly's mom said, we are incredibly thankful to everyone who has contributed to Molly's fund. Molly was pursuing her dream of becoming a child psychologist at the UI. She was incredibly generous in her life, so it is fitting that her name will live on by benefiting others. The day that article about it went live, it had already achieved over $20,000 in its first day. The next year for Molly's 21st birthday, her family set up a fundraiser in Molly's honor to go to the Brooklyn Opera House. Molly's mom released a statement to the news that said, on May 8, 2019, we'll We will be celebrating Molly's 21st birthday. It is only fitting on this day we recognize the fundraising efforts of the Brooklyn Opera House. It is also a building where Molly's grandmother, grandfather, mother, aunt, and uncle spent countless hours volunteering time and energy. The Brooklyn Opera House released a statement. Brooklyn Community Development, the nonprofit restoring the Brooklyn Opera House, is honored that Molly's movement and the Tibbetts family thought of us for Molly's birthday celebration. She lived an art-filled life with dedication to her community. We hope to fulfill everything she would have loved about this project. The first donation was from an anonymous donor for $500,000. At her funeral, her father addressed the politicization of her death for the first time, saying the Hispanic community embraced him during these difficult past few weeks and rebuked the narrative swirling around his daughter's death. He said the Hispanic community are Iowans. They have the same values as Iowans. As far as I'm concerned, they're Iowans with better food, which is funny. And then, because her death was so politicized and used as a tool for Trump's rallies about immigration, Molly's dad released a statement via an op-ed in the Des Moines Register after her body was found. He wrote, Ten days ago, we learned that Molly would not be coming home. Shattered, my family set out to celebrate Molly's extraordinary life and chose to share our sorrow in private. At the outset, politicians and pundits used Molly's death to promote various political agendas. We appealed to them, and they graciously, graciously stopped. For that, we are grateful. Sadly, others have ignored our request. They have instead chosen to callously distort and corrupt Molly's tragic death to advance a cause she vehemently opposed. I encourage the debate on immigration. There is great merit in its reasonable outcome, but I do not appropriate Molly's soul in advancing views she believes were profoundly racist. The act grievously extends the crime that stole Molly from our family and is, to quote Donald Trump Jr., heartless and despicable, because I think Donald Trump Jr. had, like, wrote an article or said something about something and he used the words heartless and despicable to describe the crime done by Rivera but so he used his own words against him he also wrote make no mistake Molly was my daughter and my best friend at her eulogy I said Molly was nobody's victim nor is she a pawn in others debate she may not be able to speak for herself but I can and will please leave us out of your debate allow us to grieve in privacy and with dignity at long last show some decency on behalf of my family and Molly's memory I'm imploring you to stop The person who was accused of taking Molly's life is no more a reflection of the Hispanic community as white supremacists are of all white people. To suggest otherwise is a lie. Justice in my America is blind. The person will receive a fair trial, as it should be. If convicted, he will face the consequences society has set. Beyond that, he deserves no more attention. Tibbetts' father said, and then he like made a joke about what he said about Molly's, at Molly's funeral, he was like, and they do have better food. (laughs) And that was the case of Molly Tibbetts. I'm sorry that was so long after I told you it definitely wasn't going to be. That just goes to show that I truly have no idea what I'm talking about when I tell you how long these cases are going to be. I hope you enjoyed it. I put a lot, a lot of time into this case. I really took my, not that I don't always take my time and look at everything I can, but I really went down the rabbit hole with this. I found so many articles, the list of sources for this case which I stopped putting in the show notes because I ran out of room. I put them on the website under the case. The list of sources is extremely long for this case. (laughs) 
Sorry, my mom just woke up and she came in here to get Harvey and Harvey lost her ever loving mind because she associates my mom's face with uh, cat food <laughs> because my mom's the one who feeds her the most. I kind of forgot what I was saying. <laughs> oh, that I just spent so much time on this, so I hope you enjoyed it. Um, let me know what you thought, what you thought per usual. Nobody ever does, but <laughs> if you feel the need to, you sure can do that. Um, I am getting better at looking at my Instagram DMs on Mad Times True Crime. If you want to follow me on Instagram and connect there, I am getting better at that. And I'm getting better at posting on time. Well, I shouldn't say that because the past couple weeks have been a mess. I've posted not at all on time. But I am trying, posting more regularly, things like that. So I'll be on there. You can also, if you just want to throw some, like throw out a suggestion you can still do it on Instagram, or there is a spot to do it on the website now at the top banner. I don't know how it looks on a phone just because I don't go to my own website that often. But on the top menu banner, there's a section that says suggest a case. If you click on that, it'll take you right to a form. Easy. You fill out, put whatever information you want, and hit submit, and it goes right to my email, my personal email. So I read that like 700 times a day. I'm like obsessive about my email. I can't have can't have unread emails. It drives me crazy. Or you can do it on Instagram. It really doesn't matter. It works the same. I throw it on there the same way. So thanks for sticking with me. I'm. It is now 11 o'clock. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my Sunday and probably not talk anymore because that was a lot, if you couldn't tell, when my voice started to just uh, not work. <laughs> and I hope you have a great rest of your week. And if you are a subscriber, I'll see you br probably not bright and early on Monday, but been releasing them in the afternoon but i will see you monday and then wednesday for a brand new case so i will see you then bye